Hey guys, I messed up. I lost the only man I've ever loved due to my selfish ideas. I hate that I hurt him, but even worse, I hate that he left. I wished he had stayed so we can work through my mistakes. I wished he had corrected me instead of walking away. I'm disappointed at the choices I made. I had a friend, a caring partner, a gem of a husband, and I chose to burn it all on a stick for some meaningless sex. I was 19 when I met my husband. He was 21. We met at a library. I had never been in a relationship before him, never even gone on dates. I was quite kept to myself, and because I was in uni to learn, I didn't want to get carried away. He first approached me at the shelves, said the usual, I've been seeing you around and I think you're beautiful. I want us to get to know each other. Can I have your digits? I turned him down clean, immediately. I didn't want to give him my number. I didn't want to know anybody in the school. I just wanted to breeze in and breeze out with my degree. Over the next few months, he would walk over to the table where I was with my friends and take a sit. He usually came with a novel, but sometimes he wouldn't and would spend time engaged in conversations with my friends. It wouldn't take long before I got accustomed to seeing him every day, watching him watch me as I read and seeing him talk gracefully with my friends. One day, he didn't show up. I was worried. I asked my friends who we always sat together at the library if they knew anything, but they all said nothing. The only one who answered me said, you know his life does not revolve around you, right? He's probably tired of waiting on you and has gone back out. I didn't know why those words hurt me then, but I knew later down the line. It was because I was slowly falling for him and being told he might have moved on hurt. I didn't see him the next day also. I asked my friends if they had got his number so I would reach out to him. Maybe he was sick. Maybe he was at a hospital or something. But they all told me that none of them took his number because I specifically asked them not to. Weird, right? The day after that, he came again, as he always did, walked in with his boys, bade them goodbye, and walked straight to the shelves. He picked up a C8301 textbook from the shelves and walked towards us. I still remember what course it was, because that was the first time I actually cared to see what books he read. Hey, what happened to you? Didn't see you two days in a row, I said as he sat down at our table. Oh, she speaks, he responded as the table burst out laughing. I am actually being serious, you know, I didn't see you for two days. I was starting to get worried, I said as I took of my glasses. I looked him dead in the eyes for, I think, the first time ever in however long the semester was. He stared back at me, first surprised, then he smirked. He was really handsome, almost like a cartoon character. I wondered why it took me that long to see it. He had an average build, which he made up for with his profound gorgeousness. He had these blue eyes that one would get lost in, and for someone who stood at a mere five foot nine, he had a tall personality. He had a very deep, raspy voice. I remember holding him when he spoke sometimes because his voice vibrated every part of my body. It was silly, but it was silly things like that that I miss right now. You, worried about me? He said after the pause, I would believe you, but I'm not even sure you know what my name is, he added. Stanley, I said immediately. My friends at the table laughed again. You see, you don't even know my name he said as he started laughing also. That's a nickname I got from junior high that followed me all the way here. Besides, it's not Stanley, it's Stan Lee, like the owner of Marvel Comics, he added. He got up and changed tables. He sat alone. I'd never seen him sit at the library before he started to move to me, and never have I seen him alone, ever. I felt like I heard him because I didn't know his name and I felt bad that I heard him. I kept looking at him from time to time, biting my nails and hoping he'd come back to our table or at the least even look back at me. He spent the next three hours buried in the books he got from the shelf. Exams were close, so it was understandable that he'd do so, but somehow I felt I was the reason why he had to divert his attention elsewhere. You know, if you miss him that bad already, you should go talk to him, my friend Sophia said to me. Go talk to him? No, no way. I put my glasses back on and went back to my books. I already understood a lot of the things in that book and that was my last bus stop in exam preparations, so I just kept flipping through it, contemplating if I really should go talk to him. I gave in, stood up, and walked towards the table where he sat. 
Come back, I'm sorry, I said, in what he went on to describe as the cutest anime-type apology ever. He looked up at me, raising an eyebrow, the way he did when he wanted someone to repeat something. I sat down at the table in front of him. It was hard to start a conversation, and he noticed, so he told me it was nothing, he wasn't angry at me or anything, although he wasn't happy that I didn't know his name. He told me that he went to sit alone because he had a test to prepare for. He said the lecturer was strict and was tight-fisted with his grading. He told me he needed to pass the course if he didn't want to be held back an additional year. Then he added that he would have stayed at the table, but figure he'd spend his time looking at me rather than reading. Okay, so what's your name then? I asked. He put the book down and looked at me, all smiles. Daniel, meet Daniel, he said, as he reached out for a handshake. I always thought Danielle and Daniel and to be the best couple name, I still do. I just don't know why I blew this up. I got up to leave, he reached for my hand. I remember being shook to the core, lol. If you'd like to be somewhere other than here, I'd like to take you out tomorrow after my test, he said. I was really happy deep down that B asked me on a date. I knew if he had done so earlier, I most likely would have Stonewall declined him. But here I was flustered, having butterflies in my tummy for this young man. To be sincere, I wish I had a time machine. I would have done a lot of things differently. I would have listened to him, would have put more effort into making him happy. I would have been less selfish. Now here I am, seeking some sort of sympathy from strangers while I cry and reminisce on the good times I shared with my Daniel. We went on the date and it was splendid. He was very funny, had a lot of things to say, a lot of meaningful things. He was charismatic, and I loved how the girls had a jealous look in their eyes when the saw us together. He told me on the date that he was runner-up Mr. UCLA, and in my head I was like rightfully so because there weren't many guys who were better looking than he was. Our relationship whilst we were at UCLA was crazy, something out of high school romance novel. He was always invited to parties, and when he went, he'd always walk hand in hand with me. We were inseparable and were crowned most influential couple in his last semester in school. Mostly because of him, I must say. Because no one really knew me before we started dating. He was my first everything. First date, first kiss, first love, first everything. I wasn't for him. Everything we ever did he had done before. Except get married. He was cool with me, always took his time to explain things I didn't understand and was slow to anger. Hmm. I was a stupid lady. I always compared our sexual experiences, and I was a bit dissatisfied that he was the only number on my own roster. I wanted to have bragging rights. I thought I was being sensible, and that me wanting to sleep with other people to even the playing field was reasonable. Months after we got married, I started to bring up the idea of us opening up our marriage. I had initially tried putting the idea out there, but the way he shut it down made me feel like I would legitimately lose him if I went ahead. I remember asking him one day what his response was going to be like if we opened things up a little bit. I didn't expect his simple and straightforward answer of, I'll walk the fuck out, no questions asked. I felt mad. I felt like he was trying to restrict me when he already had his fun outside before we got together. I waited a few months and asked him again and he gave me the same answer. This was what made me decide that I was going to wait till after we got married. I thought that he would get to see things from my point of view if we tied the knot. When we finally got married, I decided to try again. I must admit that this was very selfish of myself, getting married to him because I wanted to explore my sexuality without losing the man I love. I finally got to tie him down, so now I could do what I wanted. I wished I had listened to understand when he told me how he felt about it. His words all fell on deaf ears and now I hate myself for letting my one true love go. They say opportunity comes but once, and I know I've lost the one chance I have at being loved for who I am. I know this now, many years after losing my Daniel. I've not found anyone who treats me as good as he did. I have not found anyone who loved me even remotely close to how much he did. We went on a four month long honeymoon or what would have been a four month long holiday if I hadn't ruined it. We had dated for five years and my need to be intimate with other men had started three years in. I went on the holiday with the thought of being with someone else but him. I had fantasies of going at it in our honeymoon suite while my husband watched. I really became a real sick freak. 
There's always a nudge or a motivator to carry out diabolical things, and my motivation was named Tom. He was tall, standing at six foot five inches, and worked out regularly. He looked like a giant. His muscles were strong, and he always wore clothes that showed off the long hours he put in the gym. I was a pretty tall lady, and the men I lived and worked around were all either the same height as I am, or shorter, mind you, I am six foot one. So, you would understand why it made me shiver in my spine to find someone who made me feel small. He was a transfer to my workplace, and he was transferred straight above me in hierarchy, meaning I had to report to him daily. He was a 30-some years old man and so was older than I and my husband, or should I say ex-husband. He was a very flirtatious person, soft-spoken like he was always trying to seduce you. Reporting to him every day was hard cause I had to keep professional whilst being real turned on by the little things he did. Then one day he asked me to drinks with him. I couldn't really believe my ears. Was he hitting on me or was he just being nice? Was he into me or did he just notice how into him I was and thought he should capitalize on that? All these were the thoughts that ran through my head. I never even once thought of how my dear Daniel would feel, nor did I think much about hurting him. We went for drinks at a bar close to the office. I had drank a little more than respectable and our conversation started to sway away form, getting to know one another to a conversations not suited for public hearing. I told him of how I wanted to do more, wanted to be more than just one man's woman. I told him how I know a lot of women would gladly trade places with me, but I just wanted a little bit of experience. I told him everything from wanting to open up my marriage so that I could could find sexual liberation without feeling guilty, down to me having a crush on him. He asked me if I've discussed with my husband, which I responded, yes, but he doesn't see things the way I see them, and he said he'd walk out if I did so. Tom then said something that resonated with my foolishness. I must admit now that then, I was looking for anything that would relieve me of the responsibilities of my frivolities. I think you should stop saying it like you're asking him and start saying it like you're telling him. I think it's better he opened up the marriage for you to have your fun than for you to do things behind his back. I swear to fucking God, Tom was the epitome of bad decisions. He was the type of guy who gave the worst possible advice with an assurance that it would be best for you. Now I know that he only said those because he wanted to lay with me. That night, he made me feel like the queen of the universe. I know it was the same treatment I got from my Daniel every day, but getting that from a different man for the first time ever made me feel like a teenager again. We parted that day after sharing a kiss. I got home to my husband sleeping in the sitting room, probably from waiting so long for me to return from work. I waltzed in quietly, went in the bathroom to shower and brush my teeth so that I longer reeked of alcohol. I was still a little tipsy, but at a controllable level. I woke him up and told him I needed to speak to him about something. He told me he also had something to tell me, something exciting, he said, but he let me go first either way. He had a beautiful smile on his face as he attentively listened while I said my piece, a beautiful smile I saw fade away in seconds. I didn't mind though, because I already had it locked in my head that I was doing the right thing. I just want you to know that I'm going to have to do this. I would love it if I got your support. I don't think I can live with the fact that you're significantly more experienced than I am. It makes me feel like you had to settle with me. I don't want to be the girl that was a settlement. I want to be craved and worshipped by other men, just as you did with other women before you met me. I don't think I can be happy with this if I don't do this. We're opening the marriage and it's not up for discussion. That was the bullshit I said to the only man who loved me when everyone called me a wormed, nickname I got in uni, gotten from weird nerd. Those were the words I said to a man who literally made the nicknames go away. The man who made me get even a little bit of the attention I always thought I deserved. Those words remain edge deep in my mind, and now I cry every time I relive that situation. What sort of a dumbass young lady was I? He looked me in the eyes for a while, then bowed his head as though defeated. He sat there in silence for what seemed like an hour before saying, Well, you've said your piece, so I guess that's that. He got up and went to the bedroom, as he left, I asked him what it was he wanted to tell me. He said it was nothing, and that he was tried from brainstorming too much at the office. The next day, I went straight into my boss's arms. We were intimate in his office that morning, and that was just the beginning of it all. Tom was just my first not Daniel intimate partner. 
I had many more. I would go out with the co-workers on Fridays at their regular TGIF spot and would occasionally wake up the next Saturday in the arms of a random person I had never met nor did I ever meet after that day. I became a literal slut. My dear Daniel had to bear all this, so I thought. I knew it was a phase and that I'd grow out of it, but I didn't know the price I'd have to pay in order to gain enlightenment. I just kept playing around with different men every day or every other day. Two months later, as I was getting ready for work, Tom came around my house. He was supposed to pick me up as I thought my husband would have been gone to his workplace early, as he always did. I thought I could use that opportunity to sneak in a few rounds before heading to the office together. My husband opened the door to Tom, who stood holding flowers in his hand. I couldn't hear what was said through the water running in my hair in the shower. I walked out to hear them exchanging pleasantries. Daniel even made a joke that went, hmm, so you're the guy that screws my wife while I screw the light bulbs? Daniel was never really one to show emotions, anger, pain, disappointment, sorrow. Nope, you can't get a read on him. The only thing you'd notice is a smile or a frown. So I honestly thought as he made those jokes that he was 100% okay with our marriage being open. He even went a step further by opening the door for me as I got in Tom's car. My naive young baby brain couldn't see the grave which I had dug for my marriage. On our way to the office, Tom made jokes of how well my husband seemed to be taking the open marriage deal. He made jokes about my husband possibly being a cuck and said things like, hey, if he wants to watch, that can be arranged. That day was a Friday, but unlike every other Friday in the past two months, I didn't go out with the co-workers. Rather, I and my boss, Tom, booked a hotel with glass windows and a good view of the city's nightlife. We had good sex that night. The Saturday after, I went home. Upon opening the door, I sensed a difference in the atmosphere. Everywhere was so quiet. My husband and I never worked Saturdays, so he always spent the morning playing his favorite songs on the speaker. Even when I wasn't home until early in the morning from working the previous night or from one of my flings, he still did play his songs full blast. I went into our built-in gym to find that he wasn't on the treadmill as he almost always was on Saturdays. Then I went to the kitchen to see if he at least made coffee like he always did. I saw my favorite cup there on the kitchen counter. I smiled as I saw some semblance of the life we always had since we moved in together three years before our two-year marriage. I lifted the cup to take a drink, but it was empty. I opened the cup only to find an enveloped letter. I can't really remember what was in the letter, but I still have it with me. I kept it as a reminder that I let something so beautiful go to shit because I wanted to have more bodies. I'm really disappointed in myself. I've made a lot of silly mistakes in my years, but letting Daniel go like that is the number most stupid decision I made. I went and got the letter in the envelope. I left it in the cup, which he placed it in, the cup which after five plus years still smells like him in the insides. The note read, hey, hope you're doing good. I know you're probably wondering why you can't hear Smooth Criminal on the speakers right now. By the time you'd be reading this, I'd probably have reached SA. My company is hosting a five-year program of producing the best computer literate minds pit of Africa. And so, I would be spending the next five years living in South Africa. Don't worry, I still haven't forgotten about your infidelity. When I get back, we will get started on the divorce proceedings. I hope Tom's dick and the other dicks you hope it on to level the playing field was worth it. When you said that, I kind of thought you were joking, but yesterday proved to me that you weren't. I regret knowing you. If I could change anything in my life, I'd have left the first time you said no. You're really not worth the heartaches you've caused over the years, and I'm not going to lie. I don't wish you well. Alongside the note was a flight ticket dated for that Saturday, June the 7th, 2014, and a passport, which was for me. At the back of the flight ticket was a note that read, Remember the news I said I had two months ago? This was it. My company was going to sponsor both our stay in South Africa. They were also willing to give you a job. At the bottom of the cup was his wedding ring. My whole world came crashing down in front of me. I spent the rest of the day staring at the cup. I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink anything. I just stared at the cup. What followed was a long year of depression as my world slowly started to fall apart. Starting with the next day when Elias, Tom's best friend and longest friend came over to pick up all of Tom's belongings. 
I was crying my eyes out. I watched him and the movers he called move all of Tim's things, which had almost grown to have sentimental value to me. Elias, out of his own good heart, let me have a box of Tom's cologne and his favorite hoodie, only for him to come back the next day to get it. He walked in that day. I was still dressed in the outfit I went to work on Friday in. He practically dragged the hoodie out of my hands that day. I was weak from crying for over 24 hours. If not, I would have put up a fight. Elias looked angrily at me and said, Stan Lee told me what you did. You're a disgrace to women worldwide and I hope you regret this for the rest of your life. He then went in search of the cologne and grabbed them also. As he walked out of the house, he said, if not for the laws of the country, I would have spat in your face. You see how this room is? That's how I hope your life ends up, sad and empty. Ella's was never really one to hold back. He always said things how he saw them and also always made his intentions clearer. Whether he liked you or not, he'd say so in front of you. His words hurt me then, but they hurt more now because since my precious half left me, the house has always been sad and empty. I tried to throw myself into something or someone just to get my mind over losing my lover. Tom got transferred again, just a week after the incident, this time at his own request. I asked him why he asked for a transfer, stating that I thought we were building something, and he bluntly told me that he was moving away from me, that he had had his fun and it was time to move on. He also advised me to close my marriage with Tom before it was too late. Little did he know that it was already too late one week ago. My next boss was very strict. It didn't take long before I got queried for my mishaps due to being very unstable at the time and because I wasn't fucking him, it wasn't long before I got sacked. My parents divorced me, Elias had told them what happened. They were very religious people, and also were both ministers at the church I grew up going to. In their words, they didn't want to be associated with any prostitute who would throw her marriage down the drain, just so she could feel another man's hand running down her thighs. As for closer, I never got one. I kept my lines the same so that my Tom would reach out to me. The five years he said came and passed it and nothing happened it, he didn't even say a word nor did I hear any news of him being back in the country. I tried to reach out to Elias only to find out that Elias had joined him in South Africa a year later. I started losing all my friends. It dawned on me that most of my friends only tolerated me. It dawned on me that the only good thing I had going on was being one half of the epic D couple. Found out I wasn't funny, that I wasn't even nice to be around. I found out that I could be a very unbearable person to be around. All these things knocked me down below ground level. After Elias left me, I didn't just go back to square one, I was knocked below negative. Now in 2023, I'm 36 and almost 10 years later, I've never had any relationship past the initial three months. I fucking hate my life right now and I wish I could just pass peacefully in my sleep. I blame Daniel sometimes for leaving me just like that. I hope that any lady who's thinking of opening up their marriages see this and steer clear of that dreadful mistake of an idea. I'm still hoping that one day I'd be walking down the road and see Daniel. I want to apologize, to tell him that I've not moved on and that even though 10 years had passed, I still loved him. I want to tell him how hurting was the worst thing I ever did, that I wanted to build a new life with him. My dating life has also gone to shit. Nobody wants to be with the lady who shattered the heart of her husband just because they wanted to explore something different. I've been in several relationships, but whenever the story comes up, you could literally see the love leave the faces of these men. I still live in the house Daniel and I bought together. It's a small bungalow because we wanted a small family. I really need closure and bad. I really need his forgiveness. I need your help finding solace as I can't afford therapy because I haven't been able to hold down a job since I got sacked 10 years ago by my replacement boss. I've been bouncing. Thank you for reading through this rather long narrative. Update. This update is based on what has happened since I posted this two months ago. For those who didn't see the previous post, this is an update on how my husband, or ex-husband, depending on how you view things, left me when I decided I was going to open up our marriage. It has been over nine years since he left, and in those years, I have seen how I am literally nothing without him. I lost everyone who was close to me, mostly because they adored him and we were only around me because they had to. Well, for the first time since he left, things have started to change for the better. 
First of all, I think he saw the previous post, because not so long after I posted here, he called me. I was happy to hear his voice after such a long time. I miss that raspy baritone of his that always vibrated my body. We talked for hours and I cried, just listening to how much I hurt him really did a number on me. He said he didn't believe I was going to do something like that. He said he initially thought it was one of my late April Fool's pranks. He said a part of him died when he saw and had that conversation with Tom. He said he felt like a cuck, and that was mad at himself for staying until I broke him. He told me why he decided not to come back after the initial five years. He said that it took him the whole time to get over me, that at the end of the program he had started to be happy again. He said he didn't want to see me again because being in the same room with me would jeopardize his happiness. I in turn told him how my life had gone. Throughout what seemed like a two-hour conversation on the phone, I cried. We talked about the good old days, and I cried because I really let this man go. At the end of the conversation, he told me he would be in the U.S. in a week and that he would come see me in the house. He did come to the house in a week's time. He came to drop off the divorce papers. He saw how miserable I was in the house. He saw the cup with the letter and his ring still at the bottom. He saw how the rooms which he emptied remain empty, even almost 10 years later. For the first time since I had known him, I was finally able to get a read on his emotions, pity. I saw pity in his eyes. He asked me about my life and I told him more things that I hadn't already told him over the phone. He asked about Tom, calling him tall, ugly, buff man. I told him how things went, how Tom came, slept with me for two months and left. He kissed his teeth, something he had probably learned from his time in Africa. He shook his head and said, so two months of sex was what you threw a seven year relationship out the window for. Then he asked me how the sex was. In all honesty, I have never had someone who treated me better than Daniel did in bed. He knew me in and out and knew how to get me where I wanted to be. He wasn't like all the other guys who simply wanted to come and go. I was sad to admit that I had thrown everything that made me who I was, just for something Daniel even did better than all the other 14 men I had slept with along the line. In his pity, he offered to pay for me to get therapy. He said he had moved on and that I also deserved to move on too. He made me feel like the world revolved around me, one last time. Then he left. We have now finalized the divorce, and I'm one month into the therapy sessions all thanks to Daniel. I thank God for the perfect gift of a man that he brought along my way, and I still hate myself for ruining it. Although now it's time to focus on being a better human. It only took me 36 years. I thank you guys again for reading this. I hope nothing else would occur to make me want to come back to this. I hope now that I can finally move on.